Uh, first, make sure to welcome everybody. As the last couple of years have gone on with COVID, um, these presentations, I remember doing them in a mask. Not good, not good for anybody uh, that was here. And this is a packed house, so I appreciate everybody coming. Um, I wanted to take the time to introduce a couple of the people that we have from the plant um, that are up here with me. Um, first and foremost, somebody that you might recognize, Chuck Valentini. Chuck runs. Please be careful, all that applause will go to his head and I'll have to, that'll be a problem. Um, and then last year we announced that, uh, that Nora was going to retire and we have Nora's replacement here, Carter Sperry. And Carter comes with a, with a vast knowledge and experience in, in all kinds of uh, automotive manufacturing and is, uh, is a walk-on for us in Bowling Green. So we're happy that, uh, that you're here, and Chuck, we're happy that you're with us. Um, so let's get on with the presentation today. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that, uh, you know, I'm just not a good-looking face. I can actually do things. And what I have here is a little aluminum welding piece, and the reason I brought that is that a number of years ago, I wanted to make sure that I could do something that we expect our operators to do, which is weld, in this case, aluminum, and I am a certified Corvette aluminum body repair person. Right, right, Chuck? It's 100% true, but you can be confident to know I didn't let him weld any cars. So your car yeah. is safe. Yes. But it is true he is certified. Yes, I am certified. And I've never had, I've always told Chuck, if you're having problems out there and you can't figure it out, you just give me a call. It's the call he never wants to make. Right? Okay, so let's get going. The reason I bring that up is that uh, the topic of our conversation uh, this, uh, for this event is going to be around the body shop. So what you've seen in the past, if you wanted to dig it out, we have talked about, uh, we've had a presentation around general assembly. We've had a presentation around all of our quality processes. We've talked about the paint shop in the past, and we've also talked about the PBC or the performance build center uh, where we put together engines. So as we always do, this is an opportunity to have a little bit of interaction with a little bit of trivia Regarding, oh, by the way, if you haven't heard, tours are back on. Yeah, so don't ask me that question. Um, what's the most popular day of the week for tours in Bowling Green? Yeah, it's probably right. What we have up here, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, or whenever we're running. But that, that's too easy of an answer. The, the answer is actually Friday. So Friday is when we're the most busy, and uh, that's when I think most people are maybe getting a jump on travel plans, et cetera. And then the theme here is around the tours, because we all know how uh, fantastic that is. Um, we opened tours in November of last year. How many people or guests would you guess have visited since that time? 10,000? 10, Anybody want to bid $1? No, price is right. Over 7,000 people. So, you know, if you, if you kind of do the math, we, after, after you get up the, the, the ramp of people knowing that they're available and get to a little bit of a steady state, we probably have about 150 people on a daily basis. So that's really, really good, and we're happy that uh, people can in, come in and visit our factory. What are the two most popular tour stops for guests? Who's been on the, a new tour? Since, okay, so we have 6,000 of the 7,000 people here with us. Um, anybody have an idea about what the most popular tour stop might be? Marriage. 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 And paint. Okay, there you go with Chuck again. I'm sorry. Um, paint and end of line. So the end of line, of course, that's where the cars start. And paint shop, we have, um, and I'll say under Chuck's leadership, um, continued to augment that experience. Of course, you can not only see paint being applied, um, there are other things that are there on the walls to help make the process a little bit better understood, uh, which is pretty cool. So, nice job. 
Nice job, Chuck. Okay, and then what are the tour guide's favorite tour stop? <laughs> okay. My office. Um, marriage. So the, uh, the tour guides like to stop at, at marriage, um, and that's actually a, a one of the other fantastic things where you see uh, a large portion of the car come together. Okay, most memorial, mem memorable uh, visitors. Um, visitors from six countries in one day, and we've had a father and son duo that toured three times in one day. They wanted to see their Z06 really, really bad, and so they just kept coming around, and every time we cashed that paycheck, right? <laughs> um, I would tell you a story this individual doesn't happen to be with, but he had reached out to me uh, in the last couple of weeks, he had a Z06 that was being built, and he says, Kai, it's like it would just be great if I could see the car. I do get a lot of these emails. <laughs> um, and he was here not for the bash, but just because of the car being built, and he was going to take a tour. And I said, if you can't see the car in your tour, if I have time, I will come and find you, and we'll go take a walk and see if we can find the car. This is, that was really nice, and I didn't have to do it. And I'll tell you why. I was literally walking through the plant in my day-to-day -day business earlier in the week, and I see this tour stop, and there was an individual, one of the tour guides said, hey, and there's Kai Spandy. And so invariably, I walked over to chat with the group a little bit, and there's a guy there that is very emotional, I would say. And this was the individual. He came and had a tour to see his car being built. And where did he see the car on the line? At marriage. What are the chances of that? And it was a, it was a fantastic story. It ended with him coming up to my office a little bit later. He had a picture of him and Zora Duntoff from back in the early 70s and a story that went with that. So once again, you never know who you might meet and the fantastic stories. And then once, one more, 16 years ago, a uh, long time ago, um, a pregnant mom toured and had the chance to start a Corvette at the end of the line. And recently, that child that was born came back, and the child got a chance to start one of the cars. That's not exactly what we call having birth at the car, because like starting the car, it's a slight variation, but I think it's pretty cool. It has a transcended a generation there. So what we're going to talk about a little bit today is about the body shop, and we've got some fantastic videos. Um, Rachel Bagshaw over here in the, in the hat, raise your hand. Um, she, as always, does a fantastic job of pulling these together, and we're going to talk a little bit about the last component in our operations that we uh, will discuss, which is the body shop. So um, where is the body shop? Oh, there's little, where's Waldo, if you know what that is. That's the body shop. So if you look at from a plan view or from an aerial view of the factory, uh, the body shop is right behind the Corvette water tower, if that makes it easier as you're driving around. And in this, um, in our factory, this is just kind of a graphic representation. Tours never go into the body shop. You have to have special sleeves for cut resistant reasons and, uh, and, and the like. So this is why it's kind of neat for uh, me to be able to share that with all of you. And what is circled there is the westmost side of the plant where the body shop is. So a little bit of comparison um, here. What we have is the number of operators that we have in the different parts of our factory. As a quick reminder, we have, uh, it, we have about 1,400 people at the plant to run two shifts. Everything being equal, you'd say about 700 people per shift. It's not exactly equal. There's more people on first shift, like myself and Chuck and Carter. Um, but we not only have operators, but in our body shop and in our paint shop, we have a lot of robots, and the, it's kind of a staggering number when you look at it in this regard. 155 robots in this factory, and the number of operators that we have, it's not even 40. So a majority of what we do in the body shop is done with robots, and we do that for precision, for process control, and a lot of the ergonomic aspects, or people having to interface. It's just some pretty heavy and bulky work. Um, you'll also see down at the bottom, um, 
Chuck's other area, paint shop. That's where we have a lot of robots also, and those are what are applying paint to the various panels. So the, the, the body is, uh, is a very, very complex thing. Um, from an engineering standpoint, we could have uh, some of Josh's team come and explain uh, maybe those idiosyncrasies. However, this is a simplistic way to look at all of the components that go into, uh, into the body structure for the Corvette that we have to deal with. We have to deal with aluminum stampings. We need to deal with carbon fiber. We need to deal with extrusions, hydroformed pieces, um, castings, and then we even put up there how many steel stampings we use in this body structure, which is none. It is all aluminum with the exception of the carbon fiber rear bumper beam uh, that is put on to the back of the car. And what you can see here also, um, some of the terminologies that we, that we utilize, a pillar, hinge pillar, halo, um, and then the various sub-assemblies that are put together, um, and then those sub-assemblies come together to make the entire body. Pretty cool. All the colors represent different parts so that you can uh, you can kind of see how we have to put together all these different different parts. Okay, and there's also composite panels. So in addition to the um, aluminum that is produced in various methods, we also have these floor panels. And on the uh, uh, on either side of the car, you might call it a door jam. We call it the door ring. Um, that is actually part of the body. It's bonded in, so it's glued in. It's uh, there is the adhesive that we use, which you'll see in a, one of the videos about how we set this in and we basically glue it to the side of the car. Um, and then there's a component there for the dash that you can actually see if you, uh, if you look close at the car. And then the back of the car, um, the surround that goes around the engine and then what makes up the, uh, the space um, for luggage, that is, those are all composite pieces that we put in. Okay, in this, uh, this photograph you might think, what are you guys doing in the factory? Uh, we do have the perspective of making sure that, uh, that we have challenges inside of our factory. And Chuck and his team came up with some interesting mottos. Moving money makes, moving metal makes money. So this is kind of the motto. And every time that, uh, that the team reaches their goals on a daily basis, then they have this little trumpet that is sounded if you're in the factory and you hear it towards the end of the shift, then you know we had a really good day. And it's like, and we made some money. That's what we like to do. Um, and then the, the next one is, you know, from a, from a weld quality, uh, these are all destructive tests. We have to sacrifice a body structure um, ever so frequently to completely take apart and verify that all the welds are exactly as we would want them. And we're very proud that we are, uh, we are well over 99% uh, perfect on all those welds. And you might say, well, what, why shouldn't it be 100%? Um, we basically have the car over designed so that every joint does not have to be perfect. If there was one joint that was not perfect, one little spot weld, um, it would be ridiculous if we would have to throw away a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar body structure. So it's all built in, and this is fantastic. Um, in other parts of our business, um, it's it, that is a number that anybody who works in a welding shop would have a tremendous amount of respect for. And when you also look at this fantastic number, over ten thousand welding or joining um, technologies that we have to tear apart in each one of these cars, you'll see more details on that. Um, that's a, quite the achievement. The addition uh, of that is that you will see what we refer to as a flow drill screw. So think of kind of a self-tapping screw. It's more complicated than that. However, we drive these into the body structure, and on a daily basis, we consume over 85,000 of these little screws um, that, uh, that go in in various parts of the, of the, uh, the body structure. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, we like it when these machines work perfectly, right, Chuck? Um, they do most of the time. Or he has the direction that he needs to call me. And then we have that other conversation about, I can put screws in, too, if you need to. Okay, and then the last one here, every day that we, every day that we make rate, um, we sound this horn, and that's just a, uh, I think it's a very nice way for recognition of the team that they have achieved their goal for the day. All right, so let's take a look at this um, coupe and convertible. All the different fastening uh, methodologies, 
where we have spot welds, flow drill screws, self-piercing rivets, laser welding, structural adhesive, and then uh, different kind of metrics. We'll go through and we'll take a look at uh, what this looks like. So this is uh, spot welding. And so what you can see, this is a pretty large machine, almost the size of your arms that are coming together and, uh, and then welding different spots. You can see the little, little puff of smoke. If you've ever been in a, a steel body shop, it doesn't look like this. It looks like, you know, fire and brimstone, weld sparks flying all over the place. So it's uh, 386 or, seven, or 374 um, individual welds that we do on the body structure. And then as we go to the flow drill screws, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, your, uh, my right, your left, this is kind of a space uh, look at the body structure and where all those screws are. And as we mentioned, there's 400, almost 450 of these in the, uh, in the body structure. And then you can see photographs of what they look like. They kind of have a hex-like looking head on them. Um, and then we'll watch a video of how these go in. So you can see the parts being clamped and then this automatic uh, robotically driven machine that drives these in. Slightly more complex than putting screws in your deck on your backyard and a very, very, uh, very, very good way to, to uh, fasten multiple pieces of, of, uh, of metal. Okay. And then we go to self-piercing uh, rivets. I'll start the, the video here. Uh, this is a little bit different. You can kind of see it looks once again like a giant C-clamp that's pushing in this rivet um, that doesn't require holes to be drilled. And then like you would see maybe in aircraft manufacturing where you have to match the holes, we uh, pierce the hole and the rivet is put in. You can see that in the uh, picture in the upper right, you know, where the uh, little circle is. That's what that looks like when those are put in. And it says tolerances that are half as thick as a uh, paper clip. It's like, I wish they would have just said how many thousandths of an inch it was, uh, but it's a, it's a little bit more than a tenth of a millimeter. So it's about five or six or seven thousandths of an inch, uh, which, is, uh, which is really, really tight tolerance. The last one, this is a um, really, really cool video. This is laser welding. So we have 20 different stitches that are eight, almost nine meters. In total, uh, in total length. And uh, when we start this video, um, I would say before that, you can see that this is in a room. This has to be in a light, tight room because this isn't, you know, lasers on the heads of sharks for different reasons. Um, this is lasers that are actually welding um, metal together. And it could be a safety concern because you do have a lot of energy. This is a legitimate laser. So what you can see is the laser uh, moving through and joining very, very, uh, some of the rather thin areas of the, uh, of the body structure. And once again, you can appreciate that, uh, you know, to try to do this kind of work with, uh, with people would be a real challenge. So this is a great opportunity for, uh, for robots. That was actually sped up a couple times too. Okay, and then structural adhesive. This is basically um, an adhesive that when put together um, really makes a joint that's stronger than the parent metals in most cases. And what you can see is once again, robotically applied adhesive in different parts, very precisely put into the, uh, into the body. This adhesive is then um, clamped and depending on the, the, the application, sometimes there's fasteners that will help hold it in, uh, but this adhesive then is activated when the oven, uh, when the, the body structure goes through the coating process and then goes through the oven to cure that. It cures the glue and the, uh, the black coating that we put on the, uh, the oven, uh, in the oven. Okay, and then a little bit of a closer look at, uh, at tunnel subassembly. So what you can see here, you can see adhesive that's going on and the parts that we have shown. This is really the center part or maybe what you would call the transmission tunnel if this car had a uh, transmission. Um, going down the center of the car, we're putting that together and you can see this robot dancing back and forth and once again very precisely applying all of this adhesive.
Okay? And then this is also sped up. This is the part uh, where we had the laser welding inside that booth. This is outside of that. And what you see are the operators that are actually loading the parts. It's, it is sped up. And then uh, we have this giant turntable that, uh, that the parts are loaded into. They go then turn inside the booth. You've already seen how that welding application works. And then the turntable comes back around and the parts are then complete and ready to be unloaded. That's in what we call our, our tunnel subassembly. And then our laser weld, you can also see here where um, we have clamping and then welding. And it's actually pretty neat to be able to see this because, you know, even in our factory, we don't have a chance to look at this. We have cameras that will look at this, but we're, we're not able to actually watch this happen. Therefore, we do have, uh, in this picture, you'll see on the right-hand side, we have cameras that are looking at uh, inside spaces that we can't normally see. And then in the, uh, the photograph on the left-hand side, what you see is weld monitoring. So you might wonder, it's like, well, I think you're making up that number. How do you get 99% good welds? It's like, well, we have really good process controls because the controls that we have are sophisticated enough where they'll tell us that we're starting to have a weld problem way before we have them. So if you look closely at that photograph, you'll see the representation of the part that's being welded. All those little green dots are welds that have taken place, and the green signifies that the weld is good. If the weld was something that we would need to look at, it would be shaded a different color, red as an example, and that might not mean that the weld is bad, it just means that we need to go look at what maybe the parameters are, the setup of the material to make sure that uh, everything is working the way that we would want it to. Next we have the rail subassembly. so if you, once again, if you look at all the little pieces uh, on the, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, I'm getting that wrong, so I'm looking here and I'm trying to think over there, so it's on your right-hand side, um, these are all the pieces that would uh, make what we call uh, the rails, and this is what is right underneath the door of your car on either side, and we put all those pieces together, and once again, uh, a little bit sped up, but you can see one of our operators doing what we do in a majority of these stations is where we're really loading parts into a robotically um, operated cell, and the robots are moving, clamping, and then doing the work to, uh, to join all these parts. That is a giant casting, by the way, that, uh, that in, on the top of that you can see it's a, it's a shock tower where the top of the shock absorber goes. Um, the question is, is that a Bedford casting? Yes, that one is. There are six castings that we get from our Bedford casting operations. They're all die castings. Um, then they make up cradle sub and some of the, uh, the shock towers that you've seen. Okay, and then here's where the tunnel and the rail are put together. This is one of getting to be a body that starts to look like something, so you can see kind of the flat portions that, uh, that where the seats would go, and you can also see these robots that that is literally the length of the car with these rail pieces. You know, we are moving these things around. Yes, it's sped up a little bit, but the ability, even with these very, very large pieces, we have very precise capabilities uh, regarding picking these pieces up and then moving them around. You'll also notice the high level of integration. One robot doesn't do just one thing. It's reaching and grabbing and moving and then picking and placing and then going to, uh, to do other work. Um, the robots are very expensive, and we want to make sure that we're utilizing them to their maximum capacity in every application that we have. Okay, the, and then we have this uniframe subassembly, so we can take a look. Once again, various pieces. That's the whole body. That's like the front, again, front to the back of the car. And here we're putting in some of the parts that go in. We call them the, uh, the toe kicks. That's my, that might be... Um, you know, where your feet rest on um, in, the, in the car. And then there are spots in very few occasions where we actually do um, some 
work by hand. In this case, we have an operator that's putting some flow drill screws in. As you can see, taking that one piece and kind of bending it into position and then putting it into uh, a hole and fastening those, um, that, is, uh, uh, that is one of the very few operations that we do that are manual. Usually what we, you know, there's a fine line between what we like to do manually and what we would do automatically. Automation is, like I mentioned, it's great for things that are real challenge for the operator. They're great when you have a process that you really want to control. You want to eliminate the impact of an operator. You want a high level of consistency. Um, but what we see here is a very difficult piece of automation that, uh, that might be easily done by, uh, by one of our technicians. Okay, and then last, this is the, we're getting ready to, to call the, the body structure complete. And this is where we have what we refer to in many parts of our plants as a quality gate. We're looking at the, the body, we're walking around. Um, he's making sure, he's just not feeling that. It's a very deliberate, we want you to walk around, we want you to touch things. We need to make sure that if there's a stud that is supposed to be welded there, that it is there where it needs to be. And there might be some operations that, uh, that need to be performed. We're here, they're putting in um, a couple screws. Lastly, um, we're getting ready, the, the body is done, and it is going to be picked up. Now we have the, the, the body is complete, and we're going to move it over to what we call ELPO. And ELPO is the, uh, the coating process that we use. Um, it's actually over where our old paint shop was, so it takes quite a bit of a ride over to get the coating uh, put on and then cured in the oven, and then it has to come back because then we have to put the composite parts in the back of the, back of the car. So you can see, once again, a little bit sped up. Um, but now you can kind of see you know, the front of the car. You can see the door. And then you can see that this robot has the dexterity to take from one conveyor, from the robot, actually, and then put it onto a conveyor. That conveyor then runs, Chuck, it's got to be, what, um, four or 500 yards to Elpo and back. So it's, it's, it's got about a half a mile on it by the time they come back. And when they come back, they look like this. And this is the corrosion protection that we have, and everything looks nice and, and then ready for all of the composite uh, pieces that we put into the back of the car. In addition to those pieces, we, um, in, in Chuck's part of the body shop, we also have uh, fascias where we do sonic welding. Behind every fascia, there's brackets, there's things that we have to fasten on. Um, we don't glue them on. We actually put the two parts together and then we use ultrasonic techniques to, uh, to weld those pieces together. So here's what that, uh, what that looks like. Once again, it's really large things that are moving around. Um, one fascia goes in, one fascia comes out. And here you can see the robots. It's very, maybe it would be akin to spot welding where you're going in and with this clamp you're um, applying these loads and then um, bonding, or not actually bonding, but welding these, these small parts onto the, uh, the fascia. Here um, we are cutting off parts of the fascia that we don't need. They're put in for support. And the, one of the last things that we do is we cut those unneeded parts off. Did we bring some of those parts? Just as a little, make sure you don't leave too early. Some of these parts that, uh, that we have, different pieces, Chuck, you can show them. Um, you cut them off. So, the, and we've brought some of these in the past. It could be if you have one of the new cars, uh, one of the colors that you might like to have is a little bit of a piece. Um, we brought those just so you can look at. Maybe you can take one home as a little souvenir. Okay, the last thing that we have is the composite line, and this is after all the Elpo coating has been done on the, uh, on the body structure. And here, where we have operators that are putting little patches to make sure that, uh, that there, if there's any holes that they are filled in, and then we're putting different fasteners on that are gonna prepare for um, either the wiring harnesses or other work that needs to be done later in our trim operations. It's a really good look um, with this one. If you notice, the operator is working at a very ergonomically appropriate level. 
not out of position, making it a little bit easier for, for the operators. As we do in our general assembly area, we have the ability to lift up cars and move them to meet the operator, not having the operator have to move to meet the car. Okay, and then the surround um, install. So here you can see that the robot is applying some adhesive um, in a sped up manner. And then this will be then picked up and dropped onto the body structure. And we actually use a little bit of heat to help bond that into the, the body structure. So if you have a coupe, you can open up the back of the car and you can see the surround. If you have a convertible, you can lift the hatch and you can see some of these parts that we're putting in. And then on the, the opposing video here on the right-hand side, excuse me, um, what you see is how we move these body structures. Um, they, they basically move straight down a line and uh, they go from station to station where different work is done. So you can see that it's, uh, it's shot out and then as we add, continue to add parts, then it gets ready to be moved to general assembly. Um, this is the door ring or the door jam. So what you'll see here is one of the operators that's putting some fasteners in um, for the back part of the, uh, the car. And as those fasteners go in, we're getting that piece, which is painted now. So this is where we have painted pieces that are going on the car very, very early in the process, and they're, and they're bonded on. You can see on the, on the uh, right-hand side, that is the applicator for the adhesive. Um, and it's, it's time sensitive. We call it open time. It only can be exposed to air like maybe an RTV or any other uh, adhesive for a certain amount of time. So we do, um, on occasion, we'll just push a little bit of that adhesive out. What you see is the operator loading this into a fixture. That fixture has to be perfect because when that part is bonded on the car, the next time we find out if it's in the right spot, we have some ways to check it while it's in the body shop, but that is going to be what we would call a class A surface because the door will interact with that piece. If it's not done right, you will have a body alignment issue. So you'll see the fixture there. It's not just moving the part, but that's very precisely interacting with the frame to make sure that there's reference points um, so that the part is put on exactly how we want it. And then on the, uh, on the, uh, the side showing the, dis the dispensing um, to make sure that we always have new, clean, fresh uh, adhesive. Okay, and then we have once again a quality gate where you'll see the car, and that's actually at real speed. It's going backwards at this point, it comes out, and then we have operators that have very specific roles where they will go around and they will check all aspects of the car to make sure that all aspects of uh, any fasteners that we have put in or any hole that needs to be there, um, or in this case where we are sealing up the car, um, where we put um, this the sealant to make sure that we don't have any water coming in the car. Okay, and then the, that's really it for the body shop. The next thing that we have here is just a, a little bit about the E-Ray. Um, tomorrow, uh, Josh and a uh, team from the program team will be talking a little bit more about the E-Ray. Um, did anybody have a chance to see the presentation earlier about, uh, you know, the Rockefeller Center? That was fantastic. Um, I, I would say that I would never have volunteered, and nobody would have asked me either, so it's like I really don't have anything to worry about, you know. But if somebody said, hey, you know, we're going to go back to Iowa and we're going to go into a parking lot, I'd probably sign up for doing some donuts in a parking lot. Nonetheless, the E-Ray is fantastic. Yesterday was a pretty special day in our factory. We made the first three saleable um, E-Rays. So this means that we're moving past. It's a story. We're moving into a reality. We're making more next week. Um, and actually, as a little bit of a news flash, one of those cars next week will be uh, my next company car, which I'm excited about. It will be 
Riptide Blue. <laughs> Newsflash. Chuck, what color are you going to get? The, what's the name of the gray? Sea Wolf Gray. So, it, as a spoiler, we do have cars that are outside that are in these exact colors, but we have, like we like to do, bring the new colors so that you can see them inside if it's a little too chilly for you outside. So this is a fantastic vehicle. We're super excited about it. It, it takes the, the Corvette into a space that it's never been before, and uh, it's, it's, quite the, uh, it's quite the engineering feat. Okay, and then a little bit about, you know, manufacturing difference. Um, what we thought we would share with you, what's different in this E-Ray when we put it together? What you see here, this is from two days ago. Um, this is the battery, and we're underneath the car. You'll see this fixture that is installing the battery. You can see there's lights looking up. Operator brings the battery up into position. Magic, not magic, hard work and precision, then gets this battery seated where it needs to go. And that is probably one of the biggest changes that we have to take into consideration as we start manufacturing the hybrid version of the Corvette or the E-Ray. And once again, yeah, it's quite the fixture. And, uh, you know, this is not like back in the day where here's a, you know, 150-pound battery going lay on your back and push, do a big bench press and push it up into the car. Um, yes, we have these fixtures that, uh, that make the work quite a bit better for our operators. The, the question is how much time does it add to uh, the manufacturing process? None. Because if we had to stop, and the, let me maybe qualify the answer to that. Um, we're not stopping the line any longer. We don't stop the line. Um, and so this is a station that many years ago we knew was coming, and it was an open spot. And so we were just waiting to install the fixture so that we can install the battery. So it takes a little bit more labor, for sure. But this is the magic of having the architecture that we have, where we knew that we were going to make a coupe and then a convertible and then a right-hand drive, and then the Z06, and now the, uh, the E-Ray. And I would, I would say, what's that? Um, you're breaking up. I don't know what you're talking about. OK, the other thing that, uh, that we have um, here is the front of the car, not only the, the, the body has the battery in it, but the front of the car in the chassis has the electric motor and the drive unit uh, for the front wheels. And so that is done in our chassis area, and then um, chassis one for the battery, and then what we refer to as a chassis subassembly um, for, uh, for the electric motor, and we put that in. Lastly, we have all of the colors. So Chuck, if you wanted to go up, has everybody had a chance to see the colors? Is this is this old news, fake news, new news? If we could take these off, what we'll do is we'll have them available for others to take a look at. Um, there are three new colors, um, and there is one technically that's going to go away, right, Chuck? Th um, sorry, yeah, three. Um, Riptide is a new blue. It's out there, and I would say that it is absolutely a f fantastic uh, color. Elkhart Lake was, uh, was also very good. And then we have cacti, which is this very light colored green, replaces uh, caffeine. And then we have the sea wolf. This is what, uh, what Chuck's car is going to be. Um, and that will replace white pearl. So if you remember right, white pearl is the 70, one of the two 70th anniversary colors and quite popular. Um, I think for the 70th anniversary, Chuck, is it around 80% of the 70th anniversaries are white pearl? Well, if you remember, we had a bet on this, so if I wasn't supposed no, to mention No, we're not talking that. about that. We're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I won that better. I wouldn't have mentioned it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's about 70% of them are 70. white pearl. Yes. We did have a friendly bet. I said, nobody's going to want that white pearl. Everybody's going to want the, you know, the, uh, the carbon flash and uh, I got baited in. I had to buy. <laughs> I was told I was going to buy lunch, but it hasn't happened yet, so I owe you lunch. Hey, Kai, how come all the, how come all the wishbones on the uh, e-rays are all body color? Is it going to be 
be offered in the black? Yeah. It's an option. Yeah, yeah. Yep, it's a it's a wide body variant, so all those different ones would be. That's just the way that uh, that they were that they were spec'd out. In fact, that upper picture shows you. I think one with the black. See the one in the middle shows it. Yeah. Black. Yeah, it's kind of hidden by the uh, the opening there, but it is black. Gary, you have a question? The mass of the body before it goes to trim. I cannot tell you that. I would tell you that if I knew it. Chuck, do you have any idea what the body structure weighs? Anybody that's back there? Josh, do you remember it's? Jeff Brown. A couple hundred pounds. How much does it weigh? Right there, the guy in the hat. That was a good move. Nope, don't know for sure. What I would like to make a guess? Yeah, I don't it's like around making two. guesses. Yes. All, car all, all carbon ceramic brakes, which the E-Ray comes standard with, are covered with a foam piece. When the car is delivered, they're also delivered with the car. If you ever take a wheel off, those are supposed to go on because if you nick that carbon fiber brake rotor, bad things. So they're there for protection. It's very intentional. It's only the J57 or the, the Z07 carbon ceramic brakes. Thank you. Yeah. What percentage of anything are we going to make next year? We don't speculate. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. I, and and I, I would, I, we just don't speculate. What I would say is that we will make as many as we can. Um, and without, I, I'm, I'm trying to be as direct as I possibly can, but once again, we don't speculate. We have the, the E-Ray starting as a 24 model year. Um, I would pivot a little bit and say that the Z06, we are continuing to make more and more on a daily basis. Um, this week, we've topped 20% penetration of Z06 with all other variants, and we make about 195-ish cars a day, and so that means that we're making about 40 Z06s. There are 40 more happy people in the world every day. <laughs> There are 40 people less that will call me every day. <laughs> one more question, then we've got one more thing. Yes. Part shortages, um, that's kind of a challenge for us ongoing. You know, the, the challenge that we have is that it's nothing that we can really predict. It can be a breakdown in this machine, a material shortage there. It could be something maybe that happens in our factory. Um, so I would say two years ago, I might get these numbers pretty close. I think 33,000 vehicles. Last week or last year was about 36,000. This year, we're looking for closer to 40,000. So if the measure is, um, you know, how many total cars are we making, then the answer is yes. Um, I would say that it doesn't feel like that, though, because there's a lot going on. All right, last slide. And this is, you know, kind of a bittersweet message for all of you. Um, this is a little bit of a collage of, fic of pictures that have been taken over the years for me. I'm here to tell you that effective July 31st, I am retiring from General Motors. <laughs> Right. So, as the story goes, a month and a half or so ago, there was a program in the company to allow people to retire early, and I have voluntarily taken that opportunity. Uh, my wife, which is in the front row here, she's also retiring. The company must have thought that she's much more valuable than me because she has to stay longer. <laughs> I have been told that that time will be filled with keeping the house clean, preparing dinner, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, from me to all of you, it has been absolutely fantastic. I have had the time to move from a job to really coming over to this place that I've driven by before, but I never stopped and visited. And then I'm a board member, escalated up to a, the chairperson of this, 
And in the process of all of that work, it really doesn't mean much other than the relationships that have been able to forge over the last years. So um, I will be staying on as the board chair, which my term is done in, at the end of this year. Um, is Kay Wagner here somewhere? Back there? Kay is the chair elect. She will be taking over. And I'll be staying on as the uh, past chair. So I'll be with the museum in a leadership role for at least another year or a couple of years anyway, maybe longer. But I'm super happy and uh, super sad at the same time. But uh, just happy to, happy to have served. Thank you all. <laughs> I guess almost 32 years. So traversing from young man starting making castings to making components, working in engineering, making engines, working in product engineering, Japan, Germany, all over the place and coming here. I have been no place longer than I have been in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Eight years. Before, it was about two, maybe three years, and I was moved for one reason or another. So this is a fantastic place. Casey and I plan to stay in Bowling Green, uh, at least for the time being. We've got a, a daughter in Florida. We've got a son that's going, he's a, gonna be a senior next year at the University of Kentucky. And uh, we've got family all over the place. So we look forward to traveling. But it's been a, been a great career. What's that? Um, good point. You all have been privileged with hearing this news before the rest of the world. Um, my replacement will be named tomorrow morning, um, 8 o'clock, and I think that that's Detroit time. Don't forget me too fast for crying out loud. <laughs> yes. Yep, so the question, just to repeat it, is why don't we have the kind of the walk-along tour? If you, built, if you bought a car, why can't we come in and do that? Um, that might, I, I know the answer to the question. Um, we have given that really for the museum to manage. The challenge is that it was great when the factory ran nine or 10 hours. What happens when your car is going through the body shop at 6 a.m. and it's coming offline at 11.30? We'd have run two shifts now, so you'd have to, it would be a real chore, or it could be, you know, two full days. It could be all the second shift and then all of first shift. And so I think, which means I know when you're speaking American English, that it's just a logistics issue, and we think that it would be a real challenge for, um, for the, the museum to manage the, the tour guides and the time commitment for the individuals. Another couple questions, and I do have a call that I must get on at 3 o'clock. One more here. Uh, since you are retiring, would you then become a tour guide? <laughs> you know, it's a funny story. Okay, so the, the question was, could I become the tour guide? Um, it's like I, I could probably do a pretty good tour. Maybe. Maybe. Um, it'd be really damn expensive, though. I, I, maybe somebody would willing, be willing to pay. Um, and I would say also... <laughs> I've made it clear to Kai that we do have openings in General Assembly. There's plenty of work for him to do. I can keep him plenty busy. I can run one of those guns in, bot in Chuck's body shop. Any, a couple more questions back here? What's that? Right-hand drive we've been making for over a year. So we're shipping those to Japan, shipping those to the UK, to New Zealand and to Australia. Yep. Oh, numbers. Uh, I'm going to take a guess. I think that we're probably about 30 a week. Yeah. Yep. We're, you know, I'll tell you, we're getting to the point where we have such a massively diverse portfolio, 190 cars in any given day. Um, a number of them are export. A number of them are Z06. A number of them are right-hand drive. Um, it is, it's, it's a lot. When you walk through the factory, if you, if you haven't, 
and you have the opportunity, it's a lot to, to keep, keep going, right? Question? The question is, you know, so we build this highly integrated body structure and it's welded, it's glued, it's screwed, um, and the like. It's not like the past where it's like, oh, it's something bent, you hook up a chain to it, put a come along on it, I'm simplifying it. Um, if, there's, if there's quite a bit of damage on one of these body structures, it's a giant challenge to make a repair that will have the same level of integrity that's why if you, get, if you get bent up pretty bad in one of these cars, they, they'll most likely, they could total the car, right? We do have, uh, with our service organization, um, and Chuck does on occasion, he'll build like a side rail, and what we do is we give a large piece to be serviced, and then they'll excise the part that they might need, and then they'll put it in. We give them welding requirements, et cetera, so the, the repairs can be made properly. You can take the front end clip off of it, the back end clip off, and put new ones on. That's right. what they do. Yes. Can you give us an update on the engine build option? Uh, yes, the engine build option. Um, last time I was here, I said that we were starting it up, and I'm here to say that it's, uh, it's on a pause right now. We, and, and I would say we need to focus on just getting everything that we need going as we would like it in that space um, before we invite, invite customers in, right? So I was a little bit premature. I was excited about it. I love it. It's, I, I wish we could do it quicker. I have time for one more question, and then I'm going to leave it to Chuck and to Carter, and they can ask, you can ask them questions forever. <laughs> their, their shift is done, so get after them. Yes? No, I know the answer to that. Um, saleable means that this is a car that has all of the content that we uh, need to, that would be able to be sold at some point in time. All these cars are gonna be what, what we refer to as captured test fleet vehicles. They will be the car that I would drive, Carter would drive, Chuck would drive, other uh, individuals from Michigan. As we get close to the start of regular production, which is a different point in time, where then we would start making vehicles that would be sold to the public. Eventually, the cars that I'm driving and others are driving right now, when we are done with them, they go to auction and they are saleable. So that's, that's kind of the, how that definition works. Okay, last farewell. This will be my last presentation as the uh, plant director. I may be back. Thanks to all of you. Appreciate it. I can tell you, I can tell you that you know you guys were sad that uh, Kai is leaving. Nobody is more than us that uh, work for him on the plant uh, leadership team. And Kai's been a great uh, person to work for. He's been a great people person, great friend, and a great leader. So, as much as people here will miss him, we're going to miss him more with the daily support and interactions that we have with him. So it's a big loss for us. Uh, as it is for over here at the at the museum. So we have, uh, I don't know that I brought enough. Uh, we brought a bunch of these uh, little fascia clips, if anybody is going to want one of those. If you want one and you don't get one, don't rush the stage. I'll bring more tomorrow. So if you're, if you're here tomorrow and you don't get one today, then just tell me and I will, I will bring them uh, more over here uh, for us uh, tomorrow. Yeah, we make lots of them every day. Yes, that's right. So I don't know if anyone has. Is it, do they have time for Seawolf? Yeah, sure. uh, Seawolf's probably not in there, so I would have to get you one of those because I've only built a couple of Seawolf cars. You mean, you mean whoever the new plant manager is? Yeah, we managed Kai up, so it's okay. We'll do that. So I got that down. I waited till he left before I we, said uh, that. We got that. He will 
learn. I promise you, he will learn. There is something different about Corvette and Bowling Green Assembly than any other site he's been at before. Yeah, I'm going through the same thing. It is amazing. There was a question back here. Yeah, so we, uh, we do have a, uh, a long series of monthly PMs that we do on all of our robots. Um, so every one of these robots has a series of preventative maintenance checks and, uh, and services that we do on a monthly basis. I would tell you that that's probably one of the most significant um, roles that the uh, maintenance organization has, the skilled trades that work under me. Um, absolutely dedicate uh, uh, the biggest part of their time towards that unless we get into a breakdown situation. But every one of those robots has uh, a lot of different checks that, the, that they go through on a monthly basis. They said, oh. that'll have to be the last question. They said it's the last question we got. Then you can come see us afterwards. Yeah, I'm sure that the dealers will have uh, some type of equipment that will be in, in their in their dealerships. Yeah, they you know I, they're not going to expect a person to to do that single-handedly. Okay, thanks everybody for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for a great first day. We hope you've had a great time. Uh, I know all of you will be joining me in congratulating Kai on his well-deserved retirement. We look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow for another day of bash. Have a great afternoon.